Today is Monday, June 23rd, 2014, and we are interviewing Willard Patterson at the Santa Cruz Public Library in Santa Cruz, California. My name is Jeannie Zarnicki, and Jennifer Cockrell is recording, and we both work for the library. This interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. Bill was born February 5, 1933, in Detroit, Michigan. He served as a private first class in the U.S. Army during the Korean War. Bill, please let's start by give, telling us a little bit about your family background and what were you, you doing before you were drafted? Hmm. I was attending Iowa State University, Iowa State College in Ames, Iowa for two years as a uh, freshman and sophomore in high school. And then before that I was uh, uh, involved in uh, on the swim team in high school and I attended Peoria High School, Peoria, Illinois mm. and swam on their swim team and was popular in school and uh, lived uh, with my parents. Uh, my father was a YMCA director. Mm. He was a career YMCA man so we followed his career in different homes. Born in Detroit, lived in Ann Arbor, Bay City, uh, moved to Chicago, lived in Chicago quite a bit, Peoria, Canton, Illinois, moved to Iowa, Ottumwa, uh, close to my grandparents in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, my mother's parents, mm -hmm. and my father's parents in Kewanee, Illinois, and uh, had a had a typical 19, late 1930s Depression era childhood. Uh, nothing spectacular. A lot of childhood diseases because there was no immunizations then. Went through all the diseases you could think of, including pneumonia at age six, almost died of pneumonia. But scarlet fever, whooping cough, chicken pox, you name it. <laughs> wow. And overcame all of that. Raised in the YMCA, learned all the sports, was popular in the Y. Wherever we went, I was a YMCA brat. <laughs> and they always had swimming pools? <laughs> always swimming pools, yes. Was swimming competitively at age six. And swimming's been with me as a career ever since. Great. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a background, does that fill it? Yes. and. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when when were you drafted? Drafted in July 1953. That date will go down in infamy, as Roosevelt declared. Mm -hmm. um, I followed, I know the background on the Korean War, the conflict. There was a war because they didn't declare war, but mm -hmm. Korean conflict. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was aware of what was going on. I was drafted in Iowa because I was attending, even though my parents were living away from me, I was uh, attending Iowa State. And during the summer, I got a notice that I was drafted. And I appealed it because it didn't seem fair. I was in college and getting passing grades. But Iowa, uh, did not draft farm boys because they had an essential responsibility to it was a war essential that they raise crops mm -hmm. so to speak mm -hmm. and then they weren't drafting females so there there was missing that and then there were all the other reasons that person they were ill, they had asthma, they were deformed, they were too tall, they were too short, mm -hmm. they didn't speak English, they were so many reasons. Uh, drug, drug addictions, psychotic, neurotic, all of those you don't get drafted. Mm -hmm. So who do they, who was left? <laughs> Little little innocent here just going to school and thinking everything was great. They had signed an armistice. Why would I get drafted now? Mm. But there were short bodies in Iowa. Iowa was, it wasn't populated heavily anyway. Des Moines their principal. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. So. Well, describe your your. Basic so I was training. basically I was shocked. You were. Shocked. I was taken back. I was bewildered. Mm-hmm. But uh, my father was a uh, conscientious objector. He was too young for World War One, too old for World War Two, but he always wanted to be one. He wanted. To, so he counseled me. He said he would help me get to Canada if I wanted to avoid the draft. He said that he would help me uh, uh, become a conscientious objector for on a religious basis. But I wasn't very religious and I didn't feel I could do that and I was afraid of the federal penitentiary. So I allowed myself to be drafted. And describe your, your basic training. Where I was inducted in Des Moines. Okay and uh, sent first to uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, out in the, out in the spaces, and they said, uh, go ahead, try to go AWOL in every direction. It's over 50 miles of just desert, just nothing. You won't make it. So we were there for a couple of weeks, and then they assigned me to Fort Camel, Kentucky, as an airborne tanker, meaning I jump out of airplanes, if I volunteer, and I drive M48 tanks, heavy tanks. And I had uh, eight weeks of basic training, which was mostly just drilling and uh, firing on the, learning to fire a rifle, M1 from World War II. And uh, uh, what did I do in basic training? Mostly just drilling. Uh, Physical regimen? Yeah, they want to take away your identity. And they'll punish your body until you, you, they beat it up to the point where you, you give up on your identity. You're just being one of the group. Mm. And what was the food like? Oh, the food, you know, the food it was uh, on a metal tray and you go through a line and they go like this. And whatever hits your, that's what you eat. And you have to clean it for, it has to be clean for the first eight weeks. It's sort of like being in, the, in jail, you know? Mm-hmm. You have no life of your own. Everything is dictated. So after that, what was, what was your first job or your Well, assignment? then after the eight weeks of basic training, then I had uh, the secondary training for another eight weeks in being airborne, which means you get up at 4 a.m. and you run uh, four or five miles with an M1 rifle holding it at port arms in wool socks and boots. So you learn to shuffle airborne style and run. And uh, a lot of people signed up to jump out of airplanes. It's a static cord, you don't pull your own chute, you just jump out of the plane. But there were a lot of injuries going on and it was kind of scary, so I didn't. You got $50 a a month more if you jumped out of airplanes, so it was enticing. Um, Let's see, uh, airborne. Oh, and then I drove tanks. They put it, I was one of a crew of six in an M48, 48 ton t- tank. And uh, we were to maintain them and practice in them and go out in the long range and fire them. Hmm. And I started as a tank driver, but I had 2200 vision without my glasses on. I was near blind. And with glasses, I was corrected pretty good, to almost 20-20. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't see well enough to drive at night, the night goggles and everything, so they kicked me out of that and I was a gunner. And you had to range in with flying geese and you had three and three points and you had to make them come together so that you knew the range of your target. Well, I couldn't see those things either. <laughs> so they fired me there and I became a loader. <laughs> What's a loader do? Well, he takes these long shells like this off of the case and jams it in the breech and locks it down and then gets out of the way because the gun recoils back into the tank. And the more we heard from, uh, from actual people who had 
bit of combat in tanks, the scarier it got because everybody tries to knock out a tank. And there's uh, so many ways you can do it. So I was not happy being a tanker at all. But that was my assignment. You don't have a choice. They don't, when you're drafted, they don't say, what do you want to do? They just say, do this. Mm -hmm. So I was an airborne tanker. Mm -hmm. I was cleaning tanks one time. Uh, I'd, about four, about, it, I'd been in the Army about 12 weeks, 14 weeks, and it was Easter vacation for the colleges. And my swim team buddies from Iowa State stopped in to see me. Oh. Well, I was covered with cosmoline and oils and grease, so dejected, so despondent over being entrapped in that location. And here come in these eight smiling guys. They're on their way going through Kentucky, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, on their way to Florida. They're going to lay on the beaches for two weeks, check out the girls. <laughs> they took one look at me, and they couldn't get out of there fast enough. And it just made me realize what I looked like and how down it was. Mm -hmm. So that was that's that was the training at Fort Campbell. From there, you you shipped out to your first assignment in Korea. Yes. I got a 20-day leave to go home and uh, was assigned to Korea. And I was to spend uh, a year there. That was the assignment. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad saw me off at the tracks at the train. I was to travel by train to Fort Lewis, Washington. Debarkation point, spend a couple weeks there travel by ship over to Korea. And uh, my dad was crying, my mother was crying. They, th they thought I was going to die in Korea. So they said, uh, my dad says, uh, hate those, hate those bastards, hate them. And it was the only time I ever took my dad's advice, you know, <laughs> not to hate, but to be removed from the military mm -hmm. in disposition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pacifist. Yeah. And he's Scotch anyway, and I'm part Scotch, and we're sort of anti-authoritarian anyway, you know. So uh, I had the 21 days in, in Iowa with my friends, I uh, got to see my fiance off. She sent a letter two weeks later saying, uh, boy, you're sure doing a service to the country, but I'm going to move on with my life without you. So it was a Dear John letter. Hmm. Just kick you when you're down a little bit. <laughs> Sorry. Didn't want to wait that year. She was in college too. Mm -hmm. Had her own life. So. Uh, Traveled to Fort Lewis, Washington by train out of Iowa and uh, was there for a week and suddenly uh, my name was called up and I was told I was going to fly by a Globemaster. I wasn't going to go by ship. Wasn't going to be sick for two weeks. Just hop on over. So we went, we flew by Globemaster stopping at Midway Island on the way over and refueled. Got to watch the Goonie birds on the ground and then got back in the plane and and flew to uh, 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 Tokyo, Atlanta, Inter the Tokyo International Airport. Took a train down to Kobe and went over to uh, Edajima Island, which was a office, naval, Japanese naval officer training site. It was the elite naval officers in World War II where they trained. Hmm. And they had converted it to a, a training for the American military in uh, chemical, biological, and radiological warfare. CB, chemical, CBR mm -hmm. training. 
So for two weeks I just went to class and they told us about these agents that could kill you quickly. I don't know why, it had no application to being an airborne tanker. But it was fun training. I got to go out in the ocean at 5 o'clock every afternoon and swim around the island and play. It was nice. Then after two weeks, uh, we traveled by uh, uh, landing craft for 14 hours in rough water across from Japan to Korea. Very sickening. Mm -hmm. Got there and I was in Pusan for two weeks getting an assignment. And uh, it was raining, it was monsoon time. It was miserable. KP duty almost every day. Just, I had a bad attitude, so they would. They found out quickly that they could pick on me. I deserved it. Don't feel sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I had it coming. Latrine duty was good too. So uh, <clears throat> miserable rain, living in tents wet inside the tent as well as out. Just horrible. Two weeks. Roll call in the morning, 200 GIs all standing out there in formation. Head count. All present accounted for, sir, up and down the ranks. And uh, st staff sergeant said, we need some uh, college boys. We need some college recruits. All you guys in college, step forward. Well, I learned long ago, you never volunteer for nothing. <laughs> Don't step forward. Well, I was so miserable that I and two other GIs, just three out of 200, took a half step forward. <laughs> and uh, Darn it, two days later we didn't get orders to go directly by uh, convoy to Seoul and we were to be stationed in the barracks in brick buildings that had been uh, military officers' buildings a long time ago when the Japanese occupied Korea. And I was to be a clerk typist. Go figure. You made the right decision. I, you know, you fell in the, fall in the bucket of, and you come out smelling like a rose. <laughs> and I hadn't done a thing except risk stepping forward. One of the other guys that stepped forward with me, we became good friends and we were assigned there together and we stayed friends during the second, that whole year. Every afternoon after work, we'd go over to the library, the post library. And I just focused on S's. Salinger, Saroyan, Steinbeck, and went through the S's. <laughs> learned, learned the love of reading because of the Army. I never would have been that focused on reading. And uh, they had a, on base, they had a uh, gymnasium. They had one handball court. Now, I was a good handball player from the YMCA experience. I was very good. And you challenged in on this one court of all Korea. There's only one indoor handball court. General Maxwell Taylor, the, the general running the military in Korea at the time, he had built the handball court for himself. Had it built. And he would play other officers, but once in a while he wanted competition that was a little above what the officers provided. So I was asked to come and play General Maxwell Taylor. I was a private E2. I wasn't even a private first class yet. And a lot of fun. Any handball players that are checking this out would know playing in the cold winter of Korea, it's very cold. It was not a heated handball court indoor. So we had a 155 millimeter howitzer shell, very thick shell filled with hot water. And we'd have three handballs inside, little handballs. And we'd take w the top one out, and you, if 
it, home court advantage was you knew that the first ball was going to bounce very fast. It was just going to fly, just because the end core is heated, so very high bounce. The second ball, second time you played that ball, second point, it bounced normal. Third point, it was a dud. Just wouldn't even get to the back wall. Just plunk, like a racket ball. Well, that was an advantage if you, if you knew the court, you knew the sport, so you could play the bounce of the ball very well. So I reigned superior in that court <laughs> most evenings. Challenge in, and if you win, then you stay in the court. If you lose, you have to go back and get in line to challenge in. And they had weight training facilities and basketball courts, and it was nice. paradise. <laughs> And, and I was a clerk typist, uh, uh, I was interviewed and found that I was capable of doing that, even as a private. And I was handling secret, top secret, I wasn't cleared for it. Handling top secret files, filing them. The, major in the office didn't seem to care whether I saw these. One thing he cared for was that I, I was a private E2, no stripe. Private first class has one stripe. Corporal has two, sergeant has three. I was a private E2, no stripe. He kept trying to, he kept making me a private first class. So I'd have to go out and go off base and go into Seoul, where you're not supposed to go, and get busted. So I would come back as a private E2, because I, I didn't want rank. Rank made you responsible for other people. <laughs> rank was part of the hierarchy of the military. You're sort of in the system when you have authority. I didn't want any authority. So I kept getting busted. And that bothered him, because he, he wanted me to be a corporal. He, a couple times he promoted me right up to corporal. That was hard to get busted down two levels. So, uh, but life there was very good. It was just go in the office, be an office, have my own desk, have my own filing cabinets. And, and that was for a whole year you did that? Uh, it was for about nine months. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then what? I like. I was a swimmer from college and high school, so I would go over to the uh, the grounds, the uh, company grounds, and they had a swimming pool there, and I would enjoy swimming. Really enjoy it in the summer when it was nice out and hot. Nice to swim. And somebody uh, on on a uh, one of the officers saw me and said, "Hey, why don't you be on our little post swim team?" Sure, I'd love to. And uh, didn't get any advantages of it, but it was nice to be able to swim on a team. And I did well in a couple of meets and had good times. So I was asked to be on the uh, all Korean army swim team, which was a big bunk up, bump up. That's a lot of GIs out there. There, was, there must have been 50,000 military people still there in 54. So uh, that was a big bump up and uh, yeah. And so he said, well, you have to be in special services to do that. Well, what special services? Well, it means you don't have draw any more duty at all. You don't carry a rifle and you don't have to march and you don't have to be, do KP and you don't have to uh, be on the base all the time, you just kind of... Can we ask an aide to the coffee machine, please? An aide to coffee machine? You only have to work out twice a, twice a day with the swim team and travel to meets. Oh, I, I can handle that. <laughs> I'll handle that. Give me a try. So, yeah, I did well on a team. You know, I was fresh out of college, and we it was a very high-ranking college swim team. Iowa State was the champion of their Big Eight conference at the time. 
So I was ranked nationally in backstroke and was a good swimmer. So they, uh, so it was easy, easy duty. And uh, swam, swam around and we traveled over to Japan. And we swam all of the Japanese college swim teams in Japan. And the experience was novel there because between races, I would be sitting, waiting for my race to be called up, and all the Japanese swimmers would come around and cluster around, we who were waiting for our races, Americans, and they would just want to talk. And they would talk in broken English. Turns out they were all studying English, college English class, and they wanted to hear it, that's all. They just wanted me to talk, didn't matter what about what. <laughs> And it was, it was very flattering. <laughs> I loved it. So I, uh, I enjoyed all the swim meets in, in Japan. And between the meets and the and workouts, we got to travel around. We went by train or bus and got to go to Kobe and Tokyo and uh, Hiroshima. We got to walk around Hiroshima. Uh, it was quite an experience. Started dating some Japanese girls and enjoyed that. Learned a lot about Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, uh, what was left was uh, uh, we swam army teams, uh, other army teams, we swam Navy teams, Air Force teams, and they picked the best American swimmers to represent the army to go back to Fort Sill, Oklahoma for the once a year worldwide army swim meet. It was the culmination of swimming for that year. And so I got to travel back three months early. I only was in Korea nine months. Got to travel back early to uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And we had a big swim meet and I won three events. And they, I had three months left and they said, well, we don't, there's nothing we have left for you to do. We can't reassign you for three months, so why don't you just go home? <laughs> oh, break my heart. <laughs> and uh, they, uh, they separated me out of uh, Fort Ord. Oh, I'd never been in California. <laughs> and Fort Ord uh, was, uh, uh, I had to spend two weeks there waiting for the papers to uh, separate me from the army and the first night they assigned me to guard duty at Fort Ord and it was out on those sand hills mm -hmm. by the bay mm -hmm. and I walked the beach with the hill behind me fog couldn't see a thing cold miserable wet M1 rifle no no ammunition but an M1 rifle on the shoulder doing guard duty there's nobody else there. I, I'm defending our women and children from somebody across the Pacific, I guess. <laughs> They're going to come over and do what? <laughs> so uh, after the first night, I went AWOL every night and went into uh, uh, Monterey by bus, sat in the bars and just had a great, great <laughs> time. Just a great time. And uh, after two weeks, I went down. My parents had moved from Iowa to Southern California, Santa, Santa, Santa Ana. I had my car. My dad drove my car out for me, an old Chevy that I bought when I was at uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And uh, picked up my car and started to live the great life. My parents welcomed me home beautifully, happy to have me home. Nobody else ever said thank you, or, but I didn't deserve thanks anyway. What did I do? <laughs> I didn't defend anybody. You, you were, after that, you were actually in the reserves, the inactive I reserves? I was to be on inactive uh, reserves mm -hmm. for, for five years by law. Okay. Well, the day I left, uh, left uh, Fort Ord, to drive home, I had this big duffel bag, about that big, 
you know, stuff full of army equipment because that's my equipment. If I'm called up, I gotta have my own equipment right away. I gotta have my digging shovel and I gotta have all of my boots and my clothing and fatigues and dress uniforms. The first gasoline station I stopped in in Monterey, I left that whole bag in the, dress, in the bathroom. Just on purpose? On purpose. I wasn't gonna get called up again, that's for sure. Once is enough. Besides, I don't think the Army wanted me back anyway. So I wanted to make sure I cut my bridges and I wanted to make sure that I would never get called up again, so I wasn't. And I, I did have that inactive service to be called up. But fortunately, it was pretty peaceful. It was between Korea and Vietnam. So there wasn't any reason to be called back up. My timing was lucky. While you were in Korea, were you able to stay in touch with your family? Yes, by writing, just just in letters, and we corresponded weekly. That's good. And uh, it was service in a nice, warm building with a desk and pencils. You can write nice Easy. letters. Easy. Right. And it was mostly the letters just contained sentiment, reassuring parents. <laughs> right. And I take a few photographs. There's a few photographs in the album there showing me at my desk. I turned 21 and I have a photograph. My 21st birthday at my desk. And Christmas service. I was Christmas Day. I was doing my duty at. That must have made your parents happy. It kept mother you. reassured. Yes. Yeah, just have a couple photos, show a few of the barracks there, and people playing volleyball and telling them that I'm healthy and happy. That's great. Mm -hmm. So what, what did you do in the, the days and weeks after coming home? Oh, Southern California, first time, 1955. Surfing was just getting started. Pacific Coast Highway, if you know Pacific Coast Highway, mm -hmm. do you know it, mm -hmm. Southern California? Mm -hmm where the surfing music is just starting, that heavy guitar D music. Dick Dale. Yeah, slide, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that surfing music was just mm -hmm. starting in those little shack bars along PCH. Nice. And uh, I had freedom, I had nothing to do, but just enjoy life. Mm -hmm. But eventually you became a teacher? Well, yeah, I had to, uh, I had to get more schooling, so uh, I enrolled at Whittier College for the fall. But I had that summer, and I thought I needed, I had to earn some money. My parents weren't going to help me with college. I had to earn my own money, so I went to work at a vacuum cleaner factory <laughs> in, in Anaheim. And uh, I was the guy at the end of the assembly line that took the vacuum cleaner and put it in the box and stamped the box with a number. <laughs> and you had to keep up. It was an assembly light. It didn't stop for me. And I, I thought I could handle anything for three months. And after the first two months, I was going crazy with the, with the routine. So I went into the boss and said, I have to have a 10 cent raise. Either I get a 10 cent raise per hour, or I'm out of here. He said, don't let the door hit you in the butt <laughs> as you leave. <laughs> and I was out of there. It was okay. And uh, I had enough money to... So I enrolled at Whittier College, which was near where my parents were living. And I was going to live on campus. But they had a swim team, and they offered me a scholarship. And so I used my third year of scholarship for college and swam with their team. It was a very relaxed, easy team and easy life. And uh, in enrollment, standing in line the first day. It was a very short line because it's a private school. They treat students nice at private schools. Uh, and beside the president had gone there as a vice president. You know who that was. 
Richard R. Oh, really? Richard attended, oh, okay. uh, graduated from Whittier College I didn't know that. in Whittier, California. Hmm. So uh, I'm standing in line, and it's the P line. They had lettered. Well, standing right in front of me is this cute, sweet little lady. Young, 20 year old. She turns and smiles at me and starts talking just out of the blue. And I had promised my buddies in Korea that the first woman that smiled to me, I was going to date when I got back to the streets. And she was the first one that smiled. And so I asked her out and we went out that night. We went out every night for that whole, whole e school year. And at the end of the school year, we got married. And uh, we both wanted to live in Northern California, we wanted to get out of Southern California, so we went up to San Jose State on our honeymoon, that was our honeymoon, and enrolled at San Jose State and found an apartment across the street from the college and put a reserve on that uh, no, no bedroom, a studio, a studio apartment, $50 a month. <laughs> Five dollars extra for a carport. <coughs> and college costs fifty dollars a, sem a semester enrollment. Uh, fifty, fifty-five, some fifty-nine dollars. You could bike right on campus and bicycles were allowed. Such <coughs> a great life. And my wife had had two years of college, so she was going in as a junior. I was going in as a senior because I had the third year at Whittier. And you had the GI Bill paying for it as well. $137 a month. We could eat steaks every night. <laughs> it was great. $50 for rent. Tuition was almost for free. I was on a swimming scholarship at, at San Jose State. My fourth year, I used my last year of eligibility. So I went for San Jose State. Tommy O'Neill and the coach, we were good friends. I helped, I taught his classes for him. And uh, it was just a great life, being a GI. It didn't take crap from anybody. You know, mature student, <coughs> married, living independently, supportive wife. She's going to school full time, so am I. Great. Work on the side, uh, just look up on the bullet board and see what kinds of people in the community wanted their gardens tended to, lawns mowed, parking cars on the weekend. Stuff like that. Mm -hmm. nice. She went to work for Coast Radio in San Jose, and we we had a good life. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you and have any children? I, I graduated uh, in 1960, and then went back for a master's degree and a teaching credential for another year. So it was a graduate year. Mm -hmm. She. She and I graduated at the same time, 1960. And uh, I had a job offered waiting for me. I teach high school in Milpitas at the new Samuel Air High School swimming pool. They wanted an aquatic expert to teach physical education and coach. There was only one around. <laughs> Great. So I got a teaching job without even applying. They, af they asked me, nice. they went after me. So, uh, and uh, we went to live in Milpitas. This was, we'd been married for three years, 57 to 60, 61. We looked around and said, boy, we're ready to be parents. So, we decided to conceive and we had uh, a wonderful girl. I was the, I was fair-haired because there had been no Pattersons to have girls for generations. Really? The only boys. And I had a girl. And my brothers never did have a girl, ever. So I was really popular. <laughs> and my daughter bonded with her, my mother, so closely, and they were wonderful. And I had four wonderful years with my daughter, and then we decided to have another child, and uh, had a boy, 
And then four years later, had another boy. So a girl and two boys, eight, uh, four years apart, on purpose. Designed that way so they wouldn't compete in high school. And uh, lived in the east side of San Jose f for 17 years, up on the hill on the east side, and mm -hmm. taught high school in five high schools. Mm -hmm. in the east side Union High School District, had a great career, loved it. It was wonderful being a teacher. Just That's great. super. That's great. Very nice. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And you continued to swim as well? I got a job the first summer running the Atum, uh, excuse me, the San Jose Country Club swimming pool. Ah, nice place. I was the head guard nice and place. supervisor and, and taught lessons, swimming lessons, to all the rich kids. <laughs> it was a great job. Great. And uh, my wife got a job being the cook in the snack shop at the <laughs> end of the swimming pool. So we worked there together. And we we had a, three years there at the Tama, uh, at the San Jose Country Club, and uh, then I had the high school career, teaching swimming and water polo, coaching soccer, wrestling as well, yes. and the career included becoming a uh, a supervisor of physical education for the hundred PE teachers in the district, ten eleven high schools. Uh, hundred and I got to be their uh, support service, administrative position. So I taught half time and was a half time administrator, okay. subject area coordinator. They called me. So again, swimming came through for me all the way. And how how do you think your service um, and and uh, your experience experiences in in Korea affected your life? The Army kept popping up, even though I had hated it because they took me away from my life my, as a swimmer and as a college, a collegian. The Army kept popping up in support of my, the rest of my life. <laughs> it, it afforded me the GI Bill, go through school, three years of support. I purchased my first home on the GI Bill. And then when I moved, two more times, I transferred that GI Bill guaranteed payment through FHA. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I have a fallback position with the uh, vet, VA hospitals. I never used it, but I have that fallback position if I need it. I had insurance on my life for many years through uh, the Army. Uh, what else? Uh, every time I go to uh, where there are other uh, of the uh, veterans, veterans of foreign wars, veterans administration, veterans uh, at the uh, at the uh, fairgrounds when we have the county fair, mm -hmm. they're sitting there. All the veterans, I go over and sit down with them because I'm one of the guys. <laughs> So the, uh, the, uh, the service has always been good to me, in spite of my attitude. That's great. And I, I recognize it for what it, what it is. It's been very supportive. Yeah. I could have done without it. I could have very well done without it. It's been successful. Being raised during the Depression in the 30s, mm -hmm. I knew how to economize and how to get along with very little. But so after you retired from teaching, you ended up here in Santa Cruz. Yes, uh, quite a while after, uh, retired in 1990. 30 years, 60 to 90, and I uh, retired at age 58. Good career and retirement with a teachers union is good mm -hmm. and I had purchased a home and then had a couple other homes and I sold the home and moved into the other home and fixed it all up two years living there and then sold that 
and then uh, I had had a home in Santa Cruz I purchased 30 years before as an investment, as a rental. And college kids were re living in there for 30 years, Cabrillo College students. Well, I gutted the house and fixed it up for two years and moved into it. And uh, I've been living in Santa Cruz for 13 years now. Okay. Over in Live Oak area, 26th Street, blocked from the ocean. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I just, it's, it's a youth culture over there. <laughs> East Cliff, biking, hiking, walking every day. Uh, it's, people aren't housebound, they're out. They're, they're in their neighborhood. Nice. It's a good place to live. It's not a west side. Yeah. And I really enjoy it. That's good. And I swim in the ocean and I bicycle and I weight train and I water run, water aerobics, stay very active. I'm 81 years old and I feel like a 60 year old. That's great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good for you. Mm -hmm. Good life. Yeah. My three grown kids, uh, wonderful families, good to me. Nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you want to add that we haven't covered? No, I don't think so. I, I enjoyed, enjoyed the interview. Thank you. And I appreciate uh, the opportunity to share my story. Thank you for being so detailed. It was very nice to hear all the details of what Well, I didn't get into some of the, some of the stories we, we, we saved. Yeah? Yeah. Do you have some stories you want to add? Because uh, we could keep going. <laughs> no, I, I, don't, okay. I don't wish to. I, I, I feel like it was okay. a complete overview story. Okay. We, we did it pretty All well. All right. Well, thank you so much, Bill. We, we really You're appreciate welcome. you doing this. You're welcome. Thank you.